gathering together to worship the Lord and uh, this war. God has been so good to us and uh, we have been uh, hearing uh, uh, from, from, the, from the Psalms and also from the uh, songs that God is so uh, good. Hallelujah. Devam etrayam nallavanan. Hallelujah. Yeshu achahe. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Hallelujah. So we are sitting in the presence of God. I mean, in the presence of good God and providing God. And he is going to, I mean, uh, uh, lead us and he is going to, I mean, give us the heavenly manna to, towards the people of God this morning. Uh, we have a man of God from Texas. And I request uh, uh, dear uh, Justin to introduce uh, our uh, uh, guest speaker today. Justin will be introducing our guest speaker today. All right. I'm very happy to introduce Pastor Raymond. Uh, I'm very happy to have you here, and we all are happy to listen uh, from you. Uh, so Pastor Raymond is the pastor of a church uh, called The Gathering, which he planted with his wife, Deborah. And there's so many good things I can say about Pastor Raymond uh, during the time that I've known him, but I just wanted to keep it short with maybe how I met him and just some of the stuff that he's doing. Uh, so I met Pastor Raymond when I went to college in Reno, and I went to his church, which was at his house. And I just found that amazing that Pastor Raymond was always inviting the people uh, to his house, strangers, and always speaking the truth and the word of God to them. And that is something that uh, I recognize from Pastor Raymond. He's a man of prayer and a vision. Um, meeting, of a, meeting at his house, I was also reminded of the days when our church was also held in homes. And I know the dedication that it takes to plant a church, to set up your house as a church, and allow, you know, have people come over and have to clean it up. So I had an appreciation that Pastor Raymond, I knew Pastor Raymond had a dedication for the Lord. And that's how I met Pastor Raymond. And from that time, he's been doing so many great things and speaking life into others and really helped me in my spiritual growth uh, in the church there. Um, during, during that time, I also was able to see that the church went from the house and God opened the doors and moved it into a building. Uh, so just seeing the evidence of God and the action of God during his ministry. So I, that just shows that, uh, you know, that's just, I'm just thankful that I was able to meet Pastor Raymond. I know Pastor Raymond has planted many other churches in Texas and has been ministering in California and Nevada. Uh, one of the churches that I know that he shared with me was Bethel Church, which is in Reading. And we all know that church. Uh, so God has been continuing to use him in his ministry to speak the word, to plant churches, and to develop the Christian churches. And I'm just excited uh, to welcome Pastor Raymond today. And let's just give him a welcome, and um, we're ready to hear from your word. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. First of all, Pastor Sam, I greet you and your family in Jesus' name. Am I off video now? Okay. Yes. Let me get back on. It says unable to start. Let's figure out what happened here. Okay. Start my, okay. Let's see if that works. Am I on now? Can you see me? There we go. Very, very good. Good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and his Father who is in heaven, anxiously awaiting us to arrive there with him. I greet you, Pastor Sam, and your family. Such a privilege to meet, to meet you. I feel a little bit like the Apostle Paul, who wrote all these amazing letters of instruction and wisdom to churches he planted. The difference is I get to do this by video, and I get to see your faces. I also want to greet the, the George family. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. George, you raised some amazing children. Justin loves the Lord and was always willing to give of whatever time and resource and abilities he had for the kingdom of God. But I do want to greet one more family before we get into the word. Paul and Karen Henderson are on, and I do believe they live in Puerto Rico or Florida. They have homes in both places. And they're on here with us today, and we greet you, Paul and Karen. No better people who have lived the move of God than the Hendersons. And I'm so blessed to have them as lifelong friends. I want you to turn to Matthew 28. 19, if you get a chance, actually begin with verse 18. And I want to teach you just a brief thought that God's given me called the COVID circumstance has given the church of Jesus Christ a great gift. How many like to see Romans 8, 28 and 29 fulfilled 
for all things work together for the good to them are love, love God and are called according to his purpose. It says in verse 29, whom he did foreknow, he did predestine to become conformed to the image of his son. So while there is turbulence and chaos, we have peace and direction. And God will use things that we did not anticipate coming to redirect the bride of Christ in so powerful ways. So in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, it says this, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Thank you for putting that up. The other verse we'll need just a little bit later is Luke chapter 19, verse 13. But what I want to exhort you, and by the way, I have history in Sacramento. I was on the pastoral team at Capital Christian Center, 81 to 84, uh, 40 years ago, quite some time. But I've loved that city. It's my favorite big city in the whole world. And I'm blessed to participate with you today. Now, when I came to Christ 50 years ago, people were getting baptized on the beach. You would meet people in supermarkets and malls, and they would come to Jesus Christ. And there was a groundswell of the presence of God in every circumstance and situation. I literally called the Jesus movement the, great, the third great awakening. The first one in America was Jonathan Edwards. The second was John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. The last one was a bunch of hippies loaded on drugs who got delivered and set free and started what was called the Jesus movement. In fact, I wrote a research paper on the Jesus movement in, in the 11th grade, and the English professor gave me an A for style, but said, I don't value your content whatsoever. Why? Because the article I wrote or the research paper was confronting him with the need to give his life to Jesus Christ. So when I came to the Lord just over 50 years ago, there were some primary things every believer believed in and did and focused on. The first was we believed in the soon return of Jesus Christ. He says in that last verse, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. How many would agree with me Jesus Christ is coming back? He's coming back soon. I think we've lost the tension of living for him when we go to him and at the same time living for him. Paul says, I'm torn. How do I live for him now when I'm anxious to be with him? For to be absent in body is to be with the Lord, Paul says. We have lost our focus on the return of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of good things to live for. I'm living a great life. I'm looking out a window right now where there are horses and cows. And if I have to go shop and have to drive 20 minutes because I'm in truly in rural Texas. But the thing I knew and the thing I lived for was Jesus Christ was returning. And we wanted to do everything we could until he returned. So it's, it's not ironic that Paul and Karen are here because they have a boat and they understand this term of horizon. Horizon is an interesting phrase. The horizon is where the sun or the setting of the sun meets the earth. But another definition for horizon is something to be attained. I hope you have a couple key horizons in your life, a focal point you're pushing towards that you want to accomplish. A, I pray that you all prosper in business and in life. Uh, Pastor scripture was perfect, that those who fear the Lord lack nothing. He protects them. He takes good care of them. While we're on this planet, we should be succeeding in everything we do. And I do believe that George, Justin George is now a doctor. What a miracle story. I got to be a part of his undergraduate work. We were sad when he moved to Texas, where I moved to after he left, to extend his education the right way. But I live today with the greatest tension of my life I've ever known. I want to be with Jesus. How many look forward to the eternal kingdom of God and dwelling with him in perfection and in his glory? We don't live for just the now. We live for what's coming our way. And the older you get, the more torn you get. Yes, I'm excited, I've had a wonderful life, and I wanna continue living, and if I get the biblical promise, it's 120 years. But I look forward to being with Jesus Christ. I can't, there, there, was a, there was this picture on Facebook a while back where a lady had passed away and had gone to heaven, and it's called the first day in heaven. You're being hugged by Jesus. You're meeting the Father and the Holy Spirit, and then you're meeting all those who've gone on before you that Hebrews chapter, 
12 talks about that great cloud of witness. But be, listen to the stat, it will surprise you. 80% of church attenders today would prefer never to hear a message about the return of Christ. That was done by Christianity Today just a few months ago. Most existing Christ followers or even just church attenders don't want to hear about Jesus Christ's return. Would you agree with me? Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming soon. Now people say, Raymond, is he going to come back in your lifetime? I don't know that for certain, but I do know this. These are my last days. I'm either go he's either going to come back or I'm going to go to him, but it these are my last days. And with that in mind, we have to get that tension back. The other stat that will really alarm you is that 92% of pastors who speak every Sunday to communities of would-be Christ followers are fearful to preach about the return of Jesus Christ for fear that people will leave their church. Well, Paul and Karen will testify today, and Justin will as well. I will speak whatever the Lord's saying, regardless of the effect on people. Because when you're really speaking the Word of God, I'm sure Pastor Sam understands this more than I do, that when you preach the Word of God, you make 75% glad because they receive. The other 25%, you make sad or mad because they don't want to hear the Word. Either way, there is an end result to transformation. And I live the joy and speak them full of glory. Now that we've lost that horizon, people are not waking up every day anticipating the soon return of Jesus Christ. We've lost two fundamental principles that are mandated to we, the body of Christ. They're not options. Would you agree as Jesus ascended into heaven the, 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 the first time, he's going to ascend again the second time when he comes back. But when he ascended, would you believe the final words he spoke would be crucial hang on to kinds of words you'd want in your life. You want what Jesus said. And we love everything Jesus said, but he says, go therefore and make disciples, teaching all men. So there's two principles that must return to the, to the kingdom of God, two fundamental mandates on us that must return this hour. First of all, let's get our horizon back. Let's not live in that tension of, oh, I want to go to heaven more than I want to go to earth. No, in that tension, I want to be with the Father. I want to be with the Son. I can't wait to meet this Holy Spirit who dwells inside of me, according to 1 Corinthians 6, and he comforts me and speaks to me and counsels me. I can't wait to meet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the same time, for every minute I live here, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. In fact, before we get into these two fundamental things that are lost, would you lift your hands up in a gray? I want, I want to live this life for everything God has for me. I want to live it with effectiveness, joy unspeakable, and transformational relationships. So Jesus tells us two things. And by the way, COVID did us a great favor. You know, it's interesting, but it says, where two or more, two or more gather in my name, I'm in the midst. I'm in a room by myself. There's no doubt about that. There's, there's not two or three in this room, but there are many on this broadcast creating agreement. You know what's beautiful about Holy Spirit is that we don't have to be in the same room to be transformational. We can agree in prayer and it passes, it, it goes beyond time space. Even though we're, we're limited by time, the Holy Spirit is not and he moves very powerfully. And Jesus says, and I want God to light this fire in me, my friends, and everybody here. I'm in business full time, by the way. I, I in the last six weeks I've spoken four times on Zoom to churches all over the U.S. And the beauty of our technology is we are not limited by time and space anymore. We can be where we want to be. You know, it's interesting, but in China, you know, that being a Christ follower is still illegal. And I know there's many tensions in many countries like that. But when they meet on Sunday mornings, they don't sing out loud. They speak the word, but they make no volume. They preach the word. In fact, um, a couple people that, that I know that went to Chinese prison for their faith knew they were going. So they memorized large passages of the word so that they could speak it to themselves every day, whether they had the written word or not. Does it say speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? But on a given weekday, there are more miracles in China than in almost every country in the world. And they can't be vocal. They have to be in secret because they've captured the reality of the power of his presence, not limited by voice, not limited by hearing. They understand the full measure of the kingdom of God. 
With that in mind, I want to exhort you at Matthew chapter 28 to ask the Lord to begin to fire up your heart in two capacities. Number one, he says, go therefore to the nations. The word there is not nations as we know, like USSR, America, India. It is ethnos. The word is languages. Basically he's saying, go to every language group and present my son, or Jesus speaking of himself, present me to them, to every nation. You know what needs to fire back up in the heartbeat of, of God's people? The desire to win souls. We've lost it. Oh, we, could, we talk a lot about miracles, and it does say signs and wonders follow. When you're preaching, there should be powerful demonstrations of his word. In fact, I was uh, speaking just a few weeks ago by, um, by Zoom, and someone who had terminal cancer, we stopped, we prayed. It wasn't because I prayed. It was we were in agreement together. And the next day, went back to the doctor, and he was completely declared 100% free of cancer. You see, we were not limited by the fact that we weren't in the same room. We're not limited by the things that get in the way. We are where two or more agree, I am in the midst. But one of the passions for the miraculous to return must be a fire to win souls. Uh, I've had remarkable times, and some of the people on this, on this uh, Zoom will validate. We had times where we saw hundreds come to Jesus Christ. But did you know I'm just as excited when one person that I do business with is exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as if, in fact, I, I live in a community of 40 homes. So, yeah, we're out in the country, but there's four, it's a 40-home-gated community. And I was over with a well-known former baseball player who lives across the street. We will agree that baseball has great recognition. And you know what he said to me out of clear blue? I'm not talking about the Lord. I'm not trying to leave him right there. He says, Raymond, do you think we could start a Bible study in our community? Wow. How many know I signed up immediately? I'm in. I'm going. This was God nurturing this man's heart to have a hunger for his presence. But see, there's no hunger. It says, Paul says, how will anybody hear unless someone speaks? And how will, no one, how will speak unless someone is sent? You and I are ministers, according to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. We're ambassadors of reconciliation. We are reconciling individuals, families, and the whole world to Jesus Christ. So we got to, first of all, get our horizon back. We got to go back to saying, yes, Jesus, you're coming back. Yes, the only tension that exists in my heart is that I don't want to leave until everybody I know comes to Jesus Christ. Back in 1989, my grandmother passed away, and she was in Los Angeles, and I was in Redding, California, and she was an avid, avid Christian scientist, and she didn't believe the gospel as we know it. She, she believed in the mind over matter type of thing. The problem is her mind over matter wasn't healing her body. She was only 74 years old, and I called her up on the phone, and I called her Mammal. That was her nickname, Mammal. Would you be willing to give your life to Jesus Christ right now? Of course, she put up a big wall and said, no, you know, one of the things, one of the things that's taken over American church is we have this thing called universalism. I ran into someone the other day that says they are a Trinitarian universalist. So I asked him to explain. He says, I believe even ev everybody that's ever lived is going to heaven. Well, I was asking God for wisdom. How do you respond to that? So I asked him a simple question that kind of ruffled the hair on the back of his, of his neck. I said, so, sir, when you get to heaven, would you like to have Adolf Hitler be in the mansion next to you? He got so mad at me, I thought he was going to come at me. But see, we don't apply the realities of life and death in the right way. I desire that none should perish, but people must make a decision. And so people don't, so my grandmother, that next Sunday morning, she passed, and I was in my office praying, and the only vision I ever, ever had in my entire life as I descended into hell itself. Now, I don't know if I was awake or asleep, Paul says, I don't know, but I met the gatekeeper of, of, of hell, the person that you first meet when you're inducted into hell's corridors. It was such a hideous event, it couldn't have lasted more than five or six seconds. But from then on, I said, I desire that none should perish in a way I've never desired before that all should come to eternal life. So if Jesus is coming back soon, and I'm going to heaven when my life is over, and if he hasn't returned, if Jesus is coming back soon, 
we need to ask God to give us that sense of urgency again. And out of that, go therefore and make disciples. The word mathetes means a disciplined follower. That's the Greek word for disciple. It means one who doesn't just confess Jesus as a savior, although that's the, that's the beginning point, but begins to hang on to what they do. The other part of the other thing lost in, in, in our loss of rights, we've lost two assignments. We've lost the assignment of winning souls. And we've lost the we've lost the, the, the thing called discipleship. By the way, I was very encouraged by Pastor Sam today because he's going to make sure you get the word. He's going to always be speaking the word and declaring it. And there were some fundamental, profound promises in Psalms 34 that belong to you if you truly embrace them. In fact, let's just stop right now and lift our hands and embrace the word promised over us through Pastor Sam's word. We embrace Psalm 34 as for us, in us, through us, and to us, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The other assignment we've lost is this thing called discipleship or mentoring Christ followers. The second, in the early days, um, we discovered that when you won people to Christ, you had to get them baptized immediately and get them encountering the work of the Holy Spirit. Because once they got on a certain Christian teachings, it would be robbed before it was ever deposited. See, people walk in the Spirit, never doubt it's real. It's only those that are reading it from afar and trying to intellectually assent to the reality. No, it has to be an experience. We need desperate experiences with God. I, I'm right now mentoring a young man. We call it mentoring. I'm really discipling. But he's 43 years old. He's, been, he's one of the highest uh, phone tech guys in the world. He owns, a, he owns a company that's in 40 states. He's all over the place. He lacks for nothing. But over a conversation over phones, he reveals me he lacks Jesus Christ. I mean, oh, that was a perfect move for me. So I let him, I let him to reaffirm his previous faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not where it stops. You have to discipline. By the way, discipleship is not done by professional clergy. It's done by every believer. If you win someone to Christ, it becomes your first responsibility to make sure they're being nurtured, make sure they're in the Word. So I have Dan reading three verses, uh, excuse me, one chapter of three different books, one in the Old Testament, one in the what's called the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, and one in the New Testament. And within a year, he will have completely read the Word of God into his life. Let me tell you, that's transformation, because you can give a lot of logic, and, uh, but it's the Word of God that transforms. So when you win people to Christ, we've lost this discipleship mentality. And it's, it's, it, it's kind of a free-for-all. There are disciplines. Paul says, I don't mind exhorting you. There are disciplines that must return to the bride of Christ. And I am assuming and excited that you are already doing that. I'm reaffirming your direction. COVID-19 has forced us to rethink everything we're doing. It's not working the way it used to work. We can't just attend. And sometimes when you find that you can't attend uh, right away, you have to rethink, how am I going to navigate separation? How am I going to uh, get deep into the Word? That's why we have Zoom. That's why we have cell phones. That's why we have the capacity to get on. And uh, my, wife, my wife virtually lives with grandchildren on FaceTime. She is always on FaceTime with them. And I guess that's the part of a grandmother. But we have to return to making sure people are grown up in the things of God, that they know the word. You can't make them. They could lie to you. I, I, I don't see benefit of them not telling you the truth. But following up on a regular basis, I believe we have a good 18 months to really uh, re-navigate the challenges of the kingdom of God. I mean, I, <laughs> I had Sundays as a pastor where hundreds came to Christ, and I'm blessed by that. But because I'm not pastoring full-time has not limited my ability to win people to Christ everywhere I go. Uh, while, you were, while we were worshiping, thank you, Justin, your team, for great worship, someone called me on my cell phone. Fortunately, I had, I had myself muted at the time, and there was a problem with some business I did. Now, I usually didn't pick it up, but it was a unique situation. And I said, listen, I'll call you after I get done celebrating Jesus with, with uh, fellow Christ followers. But 
what God is really doing in that family's life is they continue to have to encounter me because he is a former pastor, a former pastor. He's not a former son, a former pastor's son. And there is conviction in his heart to return to the things of the Lord. So we are carrying the fragrance of Jesus Christ everywhere we go, but we fall short if we win them and not set our hearts to helping them grow and nurture in the things of God. So it said, Paul says in Luke chapter 13, if you'll put that up for me, Luke chapter, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 19, he says something very interesting here. It's the last verse of a parable. It's the last verse where he's talking about an owner of business who goes away, and before he goes away, he gives everybody assignments. And he says to them as a mandate, occupy till I come. Meaning, I've given you abilities, I've given you resources, you have jobs to do, do those jobs until I get back. There it says, his master answered, you take five of six, five, take, take charge of five, says another take, sir. And at the end of it, he says, occupy till I come. So I ask you, eternal life, church of God, Besides your business, and let that be a divine appointment to do, make changes, besides your business, how are you assisting your pastor in the occupation of the eternal life church of God in transforming Sacramento, in reaching out? We've lost our courage, you know, in this, this crazy day of everybody. By the way, we've become so tribal in America, it's scary. You know, it's brilliant for the enemy to get us to go into factions or tribes. I'm for this, I'm for that, I'm for all these different things. What does Paul say to all that? All I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified for me. My tribe is the kingdom of God, my family. And I had the privilege of leading a lot of my, I grew up in foster homes, but I kept connection with my family over the years. I had the privilege of leading many of them to Jesus Christ. And... <laughs> Let me tell you an interesting story. My father abandoned us when we were 11. My mother was an extreme drug user. And so my brother and I, who's now with the Lord as well, uh, we were left to take care of ourselves. And during that time, I got into some antics and some problems and those kinds of things before I ended up in group homes. But my father, bless his heart, he is now of Christ fall, and I'm grateful for that. What wasn't there for us? No judgment, just a fact. The year after I got married, he began to become an, a quadriplegic, meaning he, he could move his neck and hands and he could slightly move his wrists, but no other part of his body functioned. He lived the rest of his life in a, in a uh, wheelchair. By the way, my dad never spoke to us as kids. Once he lost the ability to walk, he learned to talk. It was pretty interesting. He became very successful at customer service in his industry. But he would come visit me particularly when we lived in Redding, California. And I had to put him to bed at night because he had no capacity to get into bed. I had to use a hoist and get him to bed. I had to bathe his entire body every day, uh, sometimes just with a sponge before he started his day. You see, God gives us a chance to make a difference when the, when the roaring tide has opposed us. In the scheme of human thinking, my dad didn't deserve a relationship with me. Certainly it shouldn't go from him not taking care of me as a young boy to my taking care of him as a 50, 60 year old man. But God gave it to me as an assignment. Oh, I didn't do well with it all the time. I had to battle a little bit of murmuring and complaining. But as the joy of the Lord overtook me, I was able to love him and minister him. And because of that, he is with the Father in heaven today, which is my greatest passion for him. No, he wasn't a father to me. Uh, he didn't even try to follow me later. We really worked at just becoming friends. But we carry the fragrance of, the, of Jesus Christ. We carry the passion of his love. And there should be radiating from our presence, the presence of God, because it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it should be radiating toward you. But if we're going to receive the gift given to us this day, by the Father, is let's not get distracted by COVID-19. There'll be other viruses. There'll be other flus. There'll, there'll be other economic times. We carry the kingdom of God against, you know, Paul says, I know what it is to be abundant, and I know what it is when there are seasons where I need 
He never lost the power of his presence and transformational life. And so my ex exhortation to you, eternal, e eternal Life Church of God, love that name. I guess that says it clearly. We believe in eternal life and we are God's church. Is God wants your community to grow in deep and new ways right now. God wants to begin to create a new dynamic even in your exchange as a community. God's going to begin to give insights and wisdom. By the way, Justin George, on a number of occasions, had great insight for a guy old enough to be almost old enough to be his grandfather. Blessing and goodness and always, always joyful, always happy, always excited because he had a dream, a vision. Everybody in this room, in this, in this, um, in this uh, surreal room needs to have a vision beyond circumstance. Uh, you know, my good friends, Paul and Karen are by definition retired. But, you know, they do more with their writings. I watch them on Facebook. They declare things. They do things. Their house is always a place of, of, of abundance and joy. Why? We never stop our vision. We may stop working our career path, but we never stop our vision. But there is a resurgence. We need to pray for pastors. You know, they're saying, we don't want to preach about the second coming. You give me a microphone, I'm talking about the return of Jesus. He's coming. In fact, Paul said, Lord, come quickly. You give me a mic. I want people to get fired up. I want people to possess three things after meeting me. Number one, a clear knowledge that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. A clear sense of eternal destiny demonstrated on the earth in their life. Divine appointments, divine opportunities. It says God makes a way where there is no way. He takes the desert and he makes a way in the desert. He takes the mountains and he makes them flat. He takes the valleys and he fills them in according to the book of Isaiah. You know, one side note is I've been studying the Old Testament prophets, and we all love Isaiah, we all love Ezekiel, we all love Jeremiah, but you know who the father of that entire movement was? A minor prophet named Amos. He discipled all of them. You see, he doesn't, he doesn't get the showcase, and by the way, the difference between a major and a minor prophet in Scripture is just the length of their writings. But isn't it amazing that a man we barely know or barely can read about is the man who projected a whole generation of prophetic insight that we read the book. I mean, without Isaiah 53, Isaiah 55, without Isaiah chapter five, there's a fire in my bones. So that's a good way to bring this to some conclusion. God wants to put a fire in our bones, a fire for his presence, a fire for his word and a fire to do what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore. The, word, the operative word is go. There's got to be movement. You can't think about sharing your faith. And let me tell you something. Please receive this exhortation as I mean it. We must be sharing our faith. If we're not telling people about Jesus, there's two fundamental challenges. Number one, we're not as excited about Jesus as we ought to be, and that happens in prayer and worship. That happens in the gathering of believers. Or two, the enemy has stolen our, 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 our voice. Somehow we feel like we cannot share, we cannot move. Would you agree that a man in my community asking us to start studying the word of God is a miracle? That's a miracle. And it's, only because, it's not because I'm profound, I'm available. I'm just available. I'm just a regular guy. When I got saved on the beach of Southern California, I wasn't anticipating all the things that God has done for me, all the magnificent things. So my, my, my son holds a 4th of July celebration. Typically between 175 and 200 come to his ranch in Sanger, Texas. And he literally, it's known as one of the best fireworks displays in, in Texas. It's pretty amazing. So he calls me up and says, hey, Dad, would you just talk about Jesus for a few minutes? How many know I volunteered immediately? I said, you guys, I don't even have to, I don't have to pray about talking about Jesus. I went there, and 10 minutes, God was able to crystallize the challenges of our day with the hope and message of Jesus Christ. People need to hear about the Lord. What does is, what is, uh, um, the Festus say to Paul in Acts 27? You almost persuade me. Why? Because the word was so penetrating and powerful that even Tertullus, the, fame, the famed and trained attorney, could not compose the power of the presence of God in, in their words. 
So first of all, I'm humbled and privileged I'm with you today. I am just overwhelmed. But before the fireworks went off on 4th of July, with a mic in my hand, I was able to tell people about Jesus Christ, for whom I live. For it says, in him we live and move and have our being. I turn 66 next month. And and, uh, by the way, my bride turned 60 last Sunday. We're both in our 60s now. As I turn into what people perceive as what would be called golden years, I don't believe in retirement, not going to retire. I'll always be busy. I want there to be as much fruit for the kingdom of God as possible. So the other thing is um, a young man met Deborah and I and asked if he could come to our house. So he came, and he is partially, um, it's one of those words, forgive me, I lost it, but he's involved in a lot of peculiar things, okay? Sat in our living room just last Saturday morning, and we prayed with him that God would reveal himself to this young man in powerful ways. And, you know, amazingly, he's encountering the Lord in great special ways, powerful ways. So my exhortation to you, and then I'm going to turn it back to your pastor. I want to pray with you, is let's get our horizon back. Let's get the urgency of the return of Jesus Christ as an important spiritual platform in our life. With that as the horizon we're focusing on, let's get our assignments back. Let's start winning souls. And I'm not assuming you're not already, and I may be preaching to the choir, as they say. But let's win souls. And number two, let's begin to make sure those we've won to Christ are really fitted in the word, fitted in prayer, fitted in the word. And so I want to take just a few minutes, and if we could all just close our eyes, if you don't mind. Close your eyes. I mean, most of you, you're not on video. I don't know if you're closing your eyes or not. But first of all, if God has brought some conviction, conviction is not condemnation. It's not, oh, you blew it. But would would you realize I have something deeper for you? If God has convicted you with this word today, would you put your hand on your heart with me? Just put your hand on your heart. And just in your own simple way, say, Father, in Jesus' name, I embrace the transformation of the word in my life right now. I embrace it. I embrace change. And how many would, while sitting and standing here, would lift their hands and say, Father, I glorify your name. And it's my desire that none should perish as it was Jesus in John chapter 3, but that all come to eternal life. And I will take bold steps of courage, bold steps of courage. And when you open the door, in fact, I pray every day, Lord, open a door though I can show my faith. Open the door so I can introduce someone who does not know Jesus who or, or has previously known him and walked away that they would encounter Jesus Christ. And Father, Father, I pray for an awakening in Sacramento. I pray you'd begin to do things in unusual ways. Lord, begin to take that city that I had the privilege of living in for three years and begin to light the fire of awakening. Well, Lord, I do pray that people that have loved God would get a deeper fire for God. But I pray those that don't believe in God and are cut off on tangent belief systems, introduce them to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Bring transformation by your spirit, by your spirit. Father, I pray for eternal life, Church of God, that these would be the finest days of Jesus Christ manifesting himself and this church prospering to its eternal assignment and purpose. Bring life, bring life by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask one one or two more questions before I pass it over. I sense there may be someone here today that has a irregular heartbeat, a I don't know if it's an arrhythmia. I don't know if someone said there's a clog somewhere or that sort of thing. But I sense there may be someone who needs God to heal their biological organ called the heart. Oh, he's healing our hearts, all right. But that is there anybody that, if, if you're, you may not be on video, but if you're there, we're going to pray for your heart right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
I ask you, Father, to take this condition of the heart, this vital blood pumping organ and cause all its, all of its veins and arteries, all of its electrical system to line up and act the way it was created to act. Lord, you've created our bodies this great ability to respond, but sometimes we need your healing supernatural touch. Heal that heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be bold here for just my pray for pastor. Father, he is a faithful man. He is deliberate in the word and deliberate uh, in how he trains things. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would give under his leadership a major harvest of souls. Give him. I'm claiming Psalm 2 over Pastor Sam. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. We pray for people from every ethnicity, every language group, every ethnos through Eternal Life Church of God to encounter Jesus Christ and become a follower. Give their great fruit. And I, Father, there's some unique, uh, unique ethnicities to eternal, e eternal Life Church of God. Expand the scope of its influence, both in its core people group and to other groups. I pray you give them great impact to impact Muslims for the kingdom of God. We pray for a harvest of Muslims, transferring kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. I pray you begin to do things uniquely. Father, I feel like you're going to use Pastor Sam for the laying on of hands and unusual miracles coming through his leadership. Release those by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I bless this community. I speak life over it. I speak abundance. And may the greatest days of Eternal Life Church of God be today and beyond. God bless you all. Thank you for letting me share. Pastor Sam, I'm turning it back to you.